A very good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for being with us. On behalf of Bank of Valletta, I'd like to ask you to take your seats so we can proceed and jump into it straight away because I know time is very valuable and we do appreciate making time for us this morning. And I know, like my good self, you're all eager to learn more about this topic and uh, most importantly about the opportunities rather than the challenges ahead of us. So, allow me to welcome Minister Stefan Zrinza Azzopardi, Dr. Gordon Codina, Chairman of Bank of Valletta, Sir Kenneth Farouja, CEO of Bank of Valletta, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us this morning. I'm seeing a wide range of people from the real estate industry, Mr. Sullivan, Buttigieg family and whatnot, policymakers, but also academia and key social partners. Somehow, as Paris David Schwere um, mentions quite often, we have the movers and shakers in our society all in one room. And that's the good news. So we're starting on a positive note, this is the good news. We have all the key people around us gathered in one room. The bad news is that we do have a challenge ahead of us. We're witnessing it every day with the news, um, but we're also experiencing here in Malta. It's called climate change. It poses risks, both physical risks, with flooding, droughts and whatnot, but also transition risks. And we're also witnessing these trans transition risks with more the heightened regulatory and the regulations, uh, you name it, I know you go through all the bureaucracy, increased bureaucracy over the past few months and years. And that's why we're here, because BOV truly believes that it plays a key role in helping Malta become more green and helping all the key economic players, including those in the real estate industry, to possibly transition in a seamless or possibly in a less impactful way. So, without further ado, I would like to invite the chairman of Bank of Valletta, Dr. Gordon Codina, to share some insights on why Bank of Valletta believes that we should discuss and challenge uh, all the key challenges and possibly um, outline the opportunities in the context of climate change. Dr. Gordon Codina. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Honorable Minister, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for being with us this morning to share the thoughts, experiences, ideas, ambitions going forward on this essential topic for our country. Not simply important, but essential to the survival and the continued prosperity of our economy and respective business and social interests. I am using this opportunity to provide the introduction to this conference to present some thoughts, hopefully provoking further discussion on this topic and uh, to perhaps invite an even stronger degree of involvement, collaboration and partnership between the critical entities and institutions involved in order to effectively transform the challenges that we are facing in this area into potential opportunities. This will always be possible, provided that there is a good will on all parties to share, to collaborate, to take a step back from certain practices which can be detrimental and move together towards a common understanding and generation of mutual good. This is the slide prepared by my compliance department. Please read it carefully and assimilate the health warning that it contains. <laughs> but I could not use numbers, you know how I am. I have to do some, some, some estimates, so there they are. Over the 
Overall, we appreciate that the question of real estate development and management, and here I emphasize not just development, but also the concept of management, because there is a culture change that we need to embrace in our business, where we're not merely developing, but we're also managing for a longer term business prospect in order to really get the best value of the asset that we are creating. We cannot avoid, we must encompass climate issues in uh, this business sphere, mainly because of three major drivers. One is international commitments which are binding on the country. These will need to be sustained by government regulation, incentives and disincentives, possibly implemented in that order. The common good may require us to be regulated if education is not enough, would require us to, to be incentivized in the proper direction, and that's why governments at the national and supranational levels exist in order to fill in the gaps where markets are not working properly. But once these two tools are used, then we must move to disincentives if proper behavior is not yet achieved. But this is the ideal way in which steps are taken. Regulate, including educate, incentive, and eventually disincentives in order to have the right behavior. Banks will once again be used as the tools to drive policy in a non-financial or monetary area. Gone are the days when we used to study monetary economics as something where banks would set interest rates as set by the central bank and pass them on to depositors and, and borrowers. Nowadays, banks have become the vehicles through which we fight financial crime, through which we ensure proper governance, and now more than ever in the coming years, banks will be the vehicles through which we will be helping and where necessary forcing the economy to take the right action when it comes to climate and resource efficient behavior. This will entail that banks will be helpful to uh, climate and environmental projects, but they will be also required to be less than helpful to uh, projects and investments which fall of requirements. This is part of the, of course, commitments of the financial service industry, but understand that these are also strongly driven by regulatory requirements, which entail costs and resource limitations, which need to be passed on to the industry. Thirdly, there will be market trends. If we want to sell our products, we must meet the patterns of demands as they are developing in future. Our real estate product is nowadays more than ever an internationally traded product. We are developing also to sell to foreign companies, setting up shop, to nomad workers, to foreign investors, also wishing to take good opportunities from the typical Mediterranean lifestyle, which we can offer here. They will be seeking quality, quality which will be certified, which will be compliant with international and global market expectations when it comes to climate and resource efficiency, so there it is. We cannot avoid having this quality upgrade in our real estate product if we want to continue to remain competitive and relevant in our economic aspirations. However, I am also here suggesting that the new approach or the revised approach towards real estate development and management is not exclusively a climate issue. We will be and we will be prioritizing and focus on obtaining climate and environmental improvements. However, 
in developing real estate in a smarter, more efficient way, we should also be seeking gains from water savings, from efficient waste management, which remains a critical challenge in our country. And here I'm not only speaking about construction waste, I'm mostly speaking of separation at source within houses in the area of municipal waste management. The economic benefits of the creation of green jobs must be brought to bear as an important dividend of the reassessment of real estate in our economy. And above all, what we need from the real estate development and management sector is a better quality of life. At the end of the day, this is what we really have to sell as an international business hub in Malta. A typically Mediterranean lifestyle, quality lifestyle through which we can attract tourists, investors, anyone who wants to make business of a global nature would be attracted to our country for health, education, whatever reason, that must be underlined and sustained by quality real estate investments, which will generate economic activity, which will therefore help that investment pay for itself profitably, as has been done in the past, but differently from the way in which we had been approaching it in the past. The product now is a mature stage where quality rather than quantity must be the driving force. It is not easy. We always say this also about tourism, about manufacturing, about various areas of activity. Now is the time for real estate to make this quality leap driven by these opportunities for climate investment, which can have other important economic effects. Now here are some numbers, again, based on some internal uh, research and, and, and facts, which can serve as a case study of the way in which we can look at this problem perhaps more holistically. Take, for example, in a typical residential real estate situation, households in Malta consuming 5,500 kilowatt hours per household per year, on average, at least within certain categories of households, there could be the opportunity to reduce 1,000 to 1,500 kilowatt hours per year. This opportunity, in order to get us to our 2050 targets, could see us having climate-related investments in around 40,000 to 60,000 new or renovated households. Rather than or, I should be stating and renovated households. It is perhaps easier to build and invest sustainably in new. It will be more difficult to go for the renovations, but renovations must also be part of the equation. Because if those are the numbers, as we can all appreciate, uh, 40 to 60,000 must involve a strong element of renovated existing household units as well within a 10 to 15 year period. So that could be how we attack it from an energy perspective, from a water perspective. Well, we know that we are one of the most water stressed countries in the world. We don't have water supply problems really and truly, but we still qualify as one of the most water stressed countries because we cannot rely on fresh rainwater sources. We must produce all of our water. Uh, we have a very low water per capita consumption at around 50 cubic meters per capita per year, which would be even lower without the impact of tourists who typically consume more than the locals uh, would. Still, there are opportunities to improve our housing so as to have better elements of water reuse through secondary systems, and especially also when it comes to wastewater um, management, which would also have carbon implications given that 
we rely on desalination to produce basically all of our water needs. Waste is where this country also have another, has another important issue and therefore opportunity. Um, uh, we produce circa one and a half tons of black bag waste. Apologies to all foreign visitors, black bag means mixed, not separated. Waste per household per year. The gray bag, namely the separated mixed packaging part, is only 10% of that. If you look at the waste recycling targets, 20, 30, 35, and 40, by 2040, we must reverse that ratio. So whatever we're putting in the black must move into the gray and properly separated rather than having the mixed bag containing itself very many different types of waste. So this requires a complete reading on how we manage space in our households to manage waste, or on how we consume in the first place, but then also how we manage waste in our households. And finally, as I said earlier on, competitiveness and well-being, we rank 31 over 150 in the CEO World Quality of Life Index. So here I'm looking purely at the perspective of NFDI and investment, looking at Malta, how, how, how is life, the quality of life there in order to invest. It is not bad, but it's not getting any better. And we don't want it to get any worse either. So definitely, we must look at real estate as part of the quality proposition which Malta needs to provide to investors in order to ensure that we remain a regional hub of choice for business. Some arithmetic behind these ideas. Let us say that in order to implement the number of measures I have been describing earlier on, we would need around 1.7 billion euros investment in the next 10 to 15 years to do this important investment in climate proofing, resource efficiency, and so on. So someone will have to sell around 150 million euro annually to achieve that investment, making profits of around 20 million euro annually, creating 1,700 jobs directly, and 2,850 through multiplier effects, the way things go in this economy. So the prospect isn't bad, but again, the problem is who will pay, as always. Possibly energy savings will not be enough. Energy savings might get us between 800 and 1 billion euro at today's prices, eh? if, uh, God forbid, energy prices were to rise, continue, and so on and so forth, then the dividend would be better. But let's not go there. We're all looking forward to a normalization of energy prices rather than continued increases. That means that the other elements must be recovered from a number of sources. Government who would help monetize savings from other elements which are not strictly energy related. I have already mentioned waste and mentioned green jobs. The real estate occupier who would be ready to pay for the better quality and the real estate industry who must also bring into this equation more efficiency in the way it is using materials and building also to counteract the increases in construction costs, which we're already experiencing because of other factors in the outside world, which are bringing inflation to the construction sector in Malta as well. And therefore, efficiency gains are also to be looked at concretely by the construction sector in order to uh, finance part of this investment. Translating this into an illustrative approach whereby we have the participation of all the partners, if we're getting down to 1.7 billion euro as investment amount, there we have the amount which we can hope for through energy savings, an additional amount which will be saved from managing 
household waste through better separation. Right? If we continue to produce mixed waste, apart from not meeting target, it's going to cost us a lot more to manage in order to separate, incinerate, export, which would be the worst thing uh, of all, uh, both from a management perspective as well as from a financial perspective, being a small isolated island. So there are important savings to be reaped as well from waste management aspects. Tax revenues, which can be created from green jobs. So these are all resources which can be generated thanks to this investment. Still not enough to cover it. According to these estimates, at least, it, they could get us up to one and a half billion euro in a 20-year period. So we must also be ready to pay a little more for our housing because it is justified by better quality. But that little more can also be reined in competitively if we also seek efficiencies in the ways in which we build and develop our assets. So it is not an impossible task. The resources are there in our economy. They can be made available over the next 20-year period. Now it is a question of getting all actors to realize that there are gains for everybody, perhaps not immediate, because this is the typical kind of investment which you undertake today with benefits over a 20 to 30 year period. Not risk-free, because once again, you know what you're going to spend today, but you don't really know what the benefits will be in terms of future prices of resources and in terms of technologies which will be developing, which is why there also needs to be a strong element of government and regulatory intervention in order to make all this happen. So to conclude, some ideas about the instruments uh, required. Definitely, we must transfer resources from those areas which are benefiting from climate investment to those areas which are spending on climate investment in order to make it uh, worthwhile. And therefore, we need to have strong mechanisms through which government is passing savings from energy production, from water and waste management, from tax revenues created by green jobs to the households making the climate investments. Typically, you would subsidize households to acquire these better homes or to renovate the existing ones. And to firms engaged in the provision of these services mainly through uh, tax, tax incentives. We also need mechanisms, and it is here why we have the largest bank in Malta promoting this conference today in the spirit of partnership with the main players, to have mechanisms whereby we valorize today, we give a value today, to the benefits which are yet to be enjoyed in future. That is why banks exist. So we need these financial institutions to create the mechanisms to provide the resources to fund the investments, which will eventually be paid, repaid through the gains realized, thanks to the mechanisms which government would need to introduce. And of course, these mechanisms must be reflecting the economic opportunities and social dimensions involved in climate investments, so that there is fairness in the distribution of benefits and costs. The arithmetic seems to be right. The players are here. What we need now is a strong dose of goodwill, trust, and optimism that there can be a future where we can overcome the current difficulties and challenges, because we must. We are compelled, we cannot avoid going through this path which will bring with it great opportunity. And with that, I thank you very much and invite the Honorable Minister Stefan Zinzrozopardi to deliver his message to this conference. Good morning. 
Mr. Chairman, Chief Executive, ladies and gentlemen, today's event is truly an important one. It is an excellent initiative which is happening at the right time. I must say that I vividly recall meeting Kenneth Farooja at the beginning of his tenure as CEO, wherein we discussed the necessity that Bank of Valletta organizes this conference, that we start a discussion on the way forward. And surely, it is encouraging to see that this bank has grasped the importance of energy efficient buildings and this event surely demonstrates the willingness that as an important stakeholder will be part if not a prime mover in the change that is necessary i think that the main trust the main team the main message that one has to put forward this morning is that this issue and the steps necessary as a way forward can no longer be postponed. We must agree that we have to upgrade the level of energy efficiency in our buildings. The time to act is now. This is a significant change, an important change, not only for the Maltese government, but also for the business community, particularly that part which operates in the real estate market in its widest sense, and to the country as a whole. It is surely the time to join forces and thus the necessity of this event, which I believe has to be followed by further similar occasions, in order that the multitude of stakeholders, particularly banks, have a clear way forward how we will plot and carry out this change together. I will not delve into so many numbers as, my, as the learned chairman, but it is a known fact that 40% of energy is consumed in activity that we have in all forms of buildings, which is responsible for 36% of greenhouse gas emissions. The buildings that we use have to be more energy efficient. The entire building and property sector must evolve to address these realities and these challenges, I must say. Behavioral changes by building users, developers, professionals involved in the construction and real estate sector need to up their game in order to achieve the necessary goals, to achieve the necessary targets. It is surely a change that cannot be spearheaded by one entity alone. It has to be a collective approach. Purchasing a property is, from a financial point of view, one of life's biggest, if not the biggest, commitment for a lot of people. A lot of hard work and sacrifice goes into purchasing a property in order to make it one's home. And whilst building a comfortable home for one's family, and this is definitely an important priority, little, if any, uh, thought is being put into ensuring that the property sold, thus purchased, is of the highest quality, in all sense, in terms of materials, building technology, that is used in its construction. Unfortunately, the consumer, the Maltese consumer, is, as a general rule, hardly aware of the conditions that he should be asking for. The consumer, when one might purchase something which is of a minor investment, a home appliance, may make a number of questions with regard to the energy efficiency of that particular appliance. However, the same questions, due to lack of awareness, are not made 
in the sale of property. And I believe this has to change. Let us call a spade by its name. The technologies adopted in the construction of a property are often traditional and in various cases leave much to be desired. This is a reflection and not the best of reflections on the key players in this stakeholder, in this particular sector. Developers, professionals, and contractors. I must state that there are developers who are going the extra mile to act differently. However, one might not say that this is the general rule. And this is the change that we need to carry out. Quality has to be the game. Quality has to be the name of the game in the development in the, in the real estate market. It is high time that investors consider thoroughly the trends in the sale of properties and also other investment opportunities. Nonetheless, investment in energy efficiency in buildings. While those opting to invest further in the property market are to ensure that they acquaint themselves with the new realities that the climate change is bringing with it and the change that we are discussing today shall bring about with regard to the sector. There is no doubt that the real estate sector in Malta was, is, and remains one of the most, if not the most, robust sectors of our economy. The property market continues to thrive, despite the global challenges that we have, that we are part of. Capital appreciation remains strong, and the cost of purchase is definitely significant. However, the quality aspect remains one which leaves much to be desired. And in res and this respect, I believe that banks have a crucial and important role to play. It is banks that finance the absolute majority of property purchases, be they residential or for commercial purpose. It is therefore pertinent that banks explain clearly to the public in general their obligations in relation to the financing of property in order that investors as a whole and purchasers, property purchasers, and anyone involved in this sector addresses the necessities of the change we are discussing today. In my opinion, banks need to roll out a clear way forward. Call it a roadmap, if you wish. And this in relation to the manner in which they shall observe and adhere to these obligations in evaluating the financing of the property purchases in relation to energy efficiency. On the regulatory aspect, the energy performance certificate that certifies the energy efficiency of each building will definitely gain more importance. Energy efficient properties are in the public interest and the changes that we would like to see are no excuse for anybody or anyone, be they developers, be they banks or other financial institutions to complicate people's lives or adopt heavily bureaucratic procedures. Access to financing for the, for the purchase of property is a key element to ensure that more people become owners of their homes. I must emphasize that we cannot simply look at this matter as if it were the financing of just another business transaction, for, in my opinion, property is a sui generis sector and has sui generis uh, objectives. Developers, on their part, need to up their game to ensure that the financing of property is not hindered as a result of the lack of energy efficient qualities in buildings placed on the market. It is high time that consumers buying a property know the energy efficiency levels of a property that is being purchased. Our aim should be to have green and sustainable buildings. This requires radical change 
in the way we build requires radical change in the way we approach the property market, the real estate market, the development sector, the construction sector. We need to create awareness. And for this, I once again thank Bank of Valletta for organizing this morning's event. Not only for the business community, but for the population as a whole. It is this discussion, it is this awareness will help facilitate the necessary change. In planning new buildings, both private and public, we must seek to speak a new language. The language of renewables, energy efficiency, better insulation of the buildings, reducing heating, cooling, ventilating, and other techniques that reduce the consumption that is necessary in day-to-day -day use of all forms of property. Energy efficiency not only saves money and provides a cleaner, healthier environment, but it also creates jobs. Let us look at this change not simply as a challenge, but let us look at it as the beginning of new business opportunities. Recently, as Minister responsible for the Public Works Department, we inaugurated a, a, a refit of a, of a building project house in Floriana, which is the head office practically of the, of the Works Department. A building which was constructed in the early 90s, highly energy inefficient, but with a 4 million euro investment, this building has been given not only a facelift, but is also has acquired new uh, energy efficient um, qualities. It is part of our plan, of our obligations under the RRP. Uh, it is an EU funded project, but in my opinion, it is also a showcase as to the technologies that we can adopt in order to have the refitting of existing buildings in order to acquire energy efficiency in existing buildings, which also in itself is a greater challenge than building new builds which are energy efficient. However, in order to achieve our objectives, we have to be prepared in order to carry out these uh, refits, which also in itself is a new potential economic activity. The European Union's Recovery and Resilience Plan provides funds for more energy efficiency in public buildings. In fact, we are undertaking a number of other projects similar to Projects House, as well as access to funding for commercial buildings in order to become more energy efficient. Definitely, all this change is aimed at achieving our environmental goals for 2050. But we have to look not simply as a goal which is in the not so near future, but we have to look at these goals as a change in how we do things now. Efforts are also underway by the Building and Construction Authority in order to make changes to the way the Energy Performance Certificate operates. This surely will be of assistance in uh, the changes that banks will have to undertake, as well as will help in the discussion as to how we change and up the game in the construction sector. I have to thank once Bank of Valletta once again for today's initiative. The change requires a collective effort. It requires that all stakeholders, governments, banks, developers, consumers, are on board, understand the need for change, and understand that the change has to happen now. This change surely cannot happen in the best of ways unless there is a collective effort. This change also requires a broad discussion where all stakeholders involved are informed, discuss, and find the right solutions that, yes, up to a certain extent, have also to be tailor-made for the realities of our country. Banks have a primary role to play. Communication is key. Clear communication is even more important. Let us look at the investment in the efforts that we need to do as an investment which will give us more returns in the not so far future. The cost of inaction is too high. We will only succeed once we bring everyone on board. This change requires 
a collective effort, a stakeholder approach. Yes, the challenges that we are facing now are the new opportunities, not only for this year, but for the future. Let us all ensure that the much needed change is done in a just and fair manner, leaving no one behind. For yes, we all stand to gain with more energy efficiency in buildings. Let us join forces. Let us make the change happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister Stefan Zrinza Sopardi, politically responsible for planning and public works, and also previously to Chairman of Bank of Valletta, Dr. Gordon Codina, for his insight and giving a price tag to climate proofing our real estate industry in Malta. So, Honorable Stefan Zrinza Sopardi said that we cannot postpone our action in this regard and to share some insights on how other countries and other partners, other construction companies, developers, real estate agents, and uh, material companies and other key stakeholders in the industry are trying to tackle becoming more operationally efficient and also trying to put sustainability as part of the core business model of all these companies to share some insights into this European perspective. We're really delighted this morning to have with us the McKinsey's global firm leader in sustainability. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Foko Imhorst. Thank you very much for this, this kind introduction and um, Minister, Chief Executive uh, and Chairman, dear guests. I'm delighted to be here. My name is Foko Imhorst. I am a partner at McKinsey and Company. I focus my work on real estate and the built environment and sustainability within. I'm extremely excited to be part of this discussion about Malta's journey, uh, a journey that every country is trying to understand on how to pursue and, and the opportunities are lying out there. It's important that we all grasp them and that we come together like we do today. There is a disclaimer. I think we can also move on. You've probably all read that similar to the, to the one we had from the chairman, important that this information stays within, within this group. Maybe if we move forward to the next slide. Oh, I've got a clicker myself. I should be doing that. Um, one thing to, to start off with, so I had the opportunity about five years ago to come to Malta for the first time. I managed to see a lot of real estate whilst I did this, but that was because I ran the half marathon. I really don't know the stock other than that. And it's you collectively who truly understand the actual building stock, the 200,000 plus dwellings you have. And collectively, you probably know exactly what the journey ahead looks like, how to best decarbonize it, and how to move to action. And so to get there requires collaboration. We've heard it several times, and this is why events like today, initiated by the Bank of Valletta, are so important. And it can only be the start of a very long journey ahead. Now, from my point of view, with that kind of background on the knowledge or lack of knowledge of the, 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 the building stock you have, what I'm trying to bring today is a perspective from a European view, from a global view, and share a little bit of insights and numbers. I do like numbers um, on, on what is happening in this space uh, across the globe, really. Now, let's start with a little bit of context sec setting. We've heard a lot the numbers on, on the built environment and how much emissions are directly influenced by it. 40% of global emissions from fuel combustion. We heard the 35% or so of greenhouse gas emissions, no matter how you cut it, it's huge. And it's also spread across, you can see that on the left-hand side, various sectors. It's not just one isolated ecosystem, which is complex on its own, but it, only, it also comes from the power sector. It comes from industry. Even within transport, we all know when building, there sits some small portion of it. So very, very fragmented and, and, and huge. Now, on the right-hand side, you see a pathway, a potential one, 1.5 degree Paris Agreement. We all know that there's various pathways out there, but we also know that collectively we have to get this hidden giant to move to achieve any of them. Any government, any organization without the real estate and built environment making a significant shift in emissions, none of these pathways will be achieved. And you can also see that the slope of this particular one, the 1.5 degree pathway, is very steep in the coming years. 
to then flatten out a little bit, meaning that the coming years will be decisive. It's extremely important to take action now. We looked at the long payback periods and the likes. A lot of these measures are longer term measures. We need to take the action now. Time is really now. And you also see at the very bottom the requirement of three times acceleration for this ecosystem. If you were expanding this chart to the left hand side and just looked at the curve on what we've done globally on real estate emissions, that's been fairly flat. We had some achievements, LED lightings and the likes. Uh, there have been energy efficiency measures in the past, but we really have to go 3x and more after the low hanging fruits are gone. So the challenge is immense, but of course that brings a ton of opportunities as well. A bit more context on the physical risk, again here underlaid with some numbers, and I'm uh, no climate scientist, but in pure statistical terms, what we see here is that the incidence of physical consequences of changing climate will likely accelerate. We see the average temperature globally in the northern hemisphere here becoming higher, and we do see that at the extreme end of the scale, the extreme temperatures and the frequency of those are also increasing significantly. This is just temperature. There's obviously other climate-related uh, um, measures that, that we could look at. Overall, this is, relates to about 75 or so uh, X risk increase in 50 years. Significant. And of course, as we're talking about real assets, we already know these assets, and we're already seeing it, are having real, uh, this is having a real implication on these assets. Um, devastating ones, as, as we're all aware, but also influencing the way we build our assets, we value our assets, and, and we operate our assets. Now, with that in mind, as a bit of context setting, what I would love to share with you at a high level now and then go a little bit deeper into each of every one of them is our core beliefs based on what we see happening in this industry globally on how to create real estate value through climate performance, because we truly believe they go hand in hand, doing the right thing for the climate and also creating real value beyond the balance sheet, but also uh, uh, economic value, social value, as, we, as we've all heard this morning. The core beliefs split into the physical risk side of things and the transitional side of things. Let's start at the top left. Climate risk have an economic impact. We see about 10 to 15% of typical portfolios, real estate portfolios, are impacted in the next seven or eight years, very, very near term. That is a, a real effect that we can see occupancy, cost, value, repricing, all elements that, that play into this due to the physical climate risk. Often, the next belief is that a few assets can drive most of that risk. In any geographically diverse portfolio, you typically see a long tail of assets. Here we say about 10% that drive the vast majority of this effect. So it requires a very focused um, and, and targeted effort to, to turn this around. How do we look at the kind of transition risk, the, the, the decarbonization journey? Our core belief is that decarbonization can be profitable. It can have a positive NPV, but it can also not be. And the underlying driver is they are typically planning, is they're doing the right measures. We call it here facilities management type of approach, a little bit shorter term uh, uh, life cycles, a little bit kind of less longer term planning, just not taking the right measures at the right time often turns this into a a non-profitable pathway, but of course we can do many, many things in planning alone to turn this around and bring these measures into the NPV positive world. And of course, on the right-hand side, profitable decarbonization is not just a technical game. It can't just be the measures itself and optimizing those, but it must also be other levers, more strategic levers we're pulling, um, procurement levers, how to source these elements at scale which roles can governments play in that as well? Stimulating industry, how do we collaborate in a purposeful way, not just for the sake of collaborating, but in a really, really meaningful way? And that all leads me to the fifth core belief. Um, the time is now, I mentioned that a couple of times, but we really do believe that there is material upside opportunity for every player in the room, for every player working in this ecosystem, and the time really to capture this is now. Asset repricing, I mentioned that as one example, is being pulled forward. We, we have already had the central banks 
five years ago or longer contacting the banks, Bank of Valletta, I'm sure you were part of it, for them asking them to assess and stress test the, the current asset base. Um, what does is, what is kind of the, the climate risk look like? And, and you know, the, the outcomes are clear that there's a, there's a big risk exposure. We now see that coming through um, in, in, into the pricing element as well. And we believe that's going to happen very, very sh shortly. The business models are evolving to capture the opportunities as well. Some players are leaning forward. They're really collaborating, they're integrating, and they're bringing very innovative solutions to this problem. And they're doing the, uh, this in a, in, a, in a very positive way. Now let's look into each and every one of those, starting with the top left one. Uh, here is an example um, that, that kind of underpins that belief. This is a commercial real estate portfolio in North America that we looked at, hundreds of assets in there. And the beauty about this for those interested in the numbers and in the science is that we can by now assess the physical implications on assets in a very, very accurate way. We can go down to 100 by 100 square meters worldwide in terms of flooding events and how they're going to change compared to the design values we used when we initially designed these assets. And this gives us a very, very accurate understanding of how repricing could look like. And you'll see here, this is even a more extreme example than the typical values I shared on the previous page. Up to 20% here is the expected value at risk of that portfolio, a far significantly slower growth than where this portfolio would be, should be typically in five years' time. So even, even closer in terms of timeline. Very, very real, very, very um, near term. And you'll see at the bottom a huge number, of course, worst case scenario assets that are also being at the risk of stranding, devastating effects for the assets and, and for the owners of the assets. Very, very important to to consider. On the right hand side, example stakeholders are demanding decarbonization. We see that in parallel happening. Tenants as just one example, and if you take a lot of international investors that are present here in this very market and that are investing, owning, operating some of the real estate, you may already feel the big, especially the big international ones, they really have ESG front and center of their mind. They're going to demand different standards they're going to demand different different assets in the near term which of course will have a, a market implication and again the downside uh, honorable minister you called it the cost of not acting here translated into offsetting cost for real estate emissions to reach net zero one billion alone for an example fortune 100 company obviously that's scaled down for smaller companies but that is significant that really really is not to be underestimated Capital providers, of course, more money is flowing into real estate, uh, into, into uh, uh, net zero related uh, technology and the likes. It's becoming more and more sophisticated of what that actually means. And we've got regulators that are also trying to bring incentives into the market, trying to make these, these solutions much more net positive. Second belief, the, the, the fact that this is typically concentrated, I think is shown very well here. A few assets drive that huge either upside or downside potential if you take a portfolio view. And we've got here a, a three or four asset classes just to illustrate the, the effect and give a few examples. Office, multifamily, data centers, and industrial. And you'll see for all of those right in the center, quite a hefty cloud, typically the assets in terms of uh, the effect on the equity value climate change has, stay within that bound, stay within where they were before. But then you've got outlayers for the office side of things. Um, a really interesting underlying drivers is not just the direct effects, but here the local economy growth that is expected due to a concentration of clean tech within that area is likely going to have a positive and upside opportunity for that very office. Multifamily, um, a, a very direct effect from, from physical climate risk happens to be this very property in, a, in an area that is going to um, expect a higher severity of flooding resulting in a negative impact. Another driver for the data centers I find fascinating. This is simply on where the data center is located. No direct physical implications, no direct 
uh, uh, um, exposure to, to local economies, but much rather the grid and the fact that this very data center sits in an area where the grid is greener, meaning the data center can provide services that are greener because they are highly reliant on the energy, which potentially gives them a premium increase and a positive impact going forward. And then we've got the industrial one, a very extreme, again, relatively straightforward example. Some industries will, in the nearer future, just scale down oil and gas here as, as one example, the extraction. That, that, re that asset is, is, is likely going to see a negative effect going forward, if not completely uh, um, uh, a devastating one. Summary, again on the right-hand side, the example of the portfolio revaluation based on physical risk is that the bulk, up to 80%, sits within these few examples. Gives us a really good opportunity to focus and not boil the ocean or, or look at it as a, as a too, too big task to address. Now on the next page, moving now into the transition risk, what we're looking, here, what we're looking at here is a a mapping of the global emissions and where they are caused in the real estate value chain. And this is not the effect of designing something and therefore the you know, building you build is allocated to, to this very value step chain, but this is rather designing and planning which is office-based white collar resources generating energy in, in, the, in the office they're sitting versus the processing and raw materials, the construction process. This is where a lot of the emissions are uh, um, are coming from when it comes to embodied carbon and, and building a new building and so on throughout the value chain. And what you'll see here is two or three things. One is, we talked about the dual mission. This must be a dual mission, both addressing the new buildings on the left-hand side, the embodied carbon, the cement, 100% of cement goes into construction, the steel, 50% or so of steel goes into construction, and the long tail of other materials, the equipment, the fuels that we're using, all this we need to address when we focus on the new buildings. But equally, we have a vast amount of existing stock, 80% or so we estimate in Europe of the 2050 stock already exists, very different to transport. You will hardly see any of the cars that you see today by 2050. A very different dynamic when it comes to kind of cycles on how to decarbonize. We have most of the assets around already today and we have to face this chunk as well, which is the bigger one. We operate far more buildings than we add at a global level each year, hence this number being, being bigger in absolute terms, but both too big to be ignored and both require completely different approaches. Now, this is the global view. If you look at almost every European country, you'll get a very similar picture. If you also look at portfolios of developers and operators, you also get a very similar picture. There's usually a pipeline of new developments and a, a set of assets that are being, being operated and used. So not just a global kind of view, but often translate and trickles down in, in the same way um, at portfolio level. Now, if we look at the operational emissions, as this is the biggest chunk Again, a few facts and numbers behind this, and this is the overall European building stock. It's largely driven by heating. Space and water heating, often um, heated by fossil fuels, of course, very different here in Malta, so a different challenge, but each country, each region has their own nuances. This is Europe alone. And of course, the space and water heating is a combination of both the heating source you're having, I, I refer to the fossil fuels, but also the shell and how good our shell um, is, is prepared and how much energy is leaking. And there again, very similar to what we see across Europe, which is a fairly poor shell, especially on the older buildings, and what we see here in Malta. So whilst there's differences, we have also a lot of commonalities. The rest, cooking, lighting, appliances, more or less the long tail, very interesting, I thought, the appliances side of things. Whilst we are getting much, much better in having more efficient, and the example was used earlier, tech uh, appliances like our fridges, like our washing machines, and we ask a lot of questions, we're at the same time adding a lot of smaller appliances that we're charging in the house, so the overall outlook there is relatively flat. That's more one for the power sector to then, to then generate more renewable energy, but I thought that was a, an interesting one as it's uh, the second biggest one in here as well. If we then flip to the good, good news and, and look a little bit into the solution space, the good news is we know already a lot about what the future pathways could look like. Now in this particular example, and this is just one of many, many example pathways, we've taken the entire European building stock, 230 million buildings plus, 
we've set a few boundary conditions saying the EU is optimizing across borders and also at system level. So not just for buildings, but also across other industries. Can hydrogen be better used in, uh, in, the, in, in to decarbonize an industrial process versus heating a house somewhere in Scandinavia. All this has been considered and we've optimized here that entire stock for the most cost optimal pathway. We saw a lot of other benefits, economic growth, employment. These were all secondary or, 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 or beyond um, priorities. We really focused on the most cost optimal pathway. And as an outcome, you'll see here on the left hand side, starting with the existing stock being uh, in, in percentage share, but effectively being 230 million plus buildings. We start off with a lot of gas boilers. We have a lot of uh, oil boilers in there as well, and very few solar thermals, others heat pumps certainly, and, and district heating. And the district heating that's currently here often um, fueled by non-renewables, so also not the kind of district heating we would like to see and we will see towards the end. And if you then take the cost optimal view, optimize this as a portfolio level, European wide uh, and across industries. One of the pictures that you could paint is that by the end of 2050, you're ending up with about 70% or so of buildings being uh, um, heated with a technology mix of heat pumps and district heating with biogas and hydrogen boilers also making up a, a, big, a big chunk. Interesting, I think, on the solar thermal side of things, that doesn't really work on a cost optimal um, level as a standalone solution, which I'm sure you're experiencing here in Malta as well. You need to still, for several weeks or months per year, need a backup solution if this is the, the one you're relying on to heat your house. Very cost efficient, very green, but often doesn't work as a standalone option. And you'll also see here the gas one being completely phased out. This isn't just modeling the cost optimal pathway, but this is also cross-checking it with the real world. And you'll see the gas one is plateauing between 2030, 2035. With our assumptions and, and you know, considering where the technology mix and cost would be, it may actually make sense to continue heating more with gas during that period of time. But we kept the model there because we already know that governments are going to put in regulation in place that will most likely keep this as a flat level and not allow new developments certainly to, to, to run on this. Again, one, one of many, many pathways. I find this fascinating. We, we, we tend to have a really good understanding of the solutions. The technology is often there, but of course it's the timing that we're not sure about, and it's also the mix, and, and when it comes to specific building stocks like here in Malta, uh, how that mix is gonna pay out over time. Of course, very important, this is just one side of the equation. This needs to be combined with improving thermal insulation levels, not just to capture uh, the, the efficiencies coming from there, but often also to enable these technologies to work. A heat pump won't run <clears throat> at a certain low, low grade insulation level. It needs to be improved before you, have, you, before you can make it run efficiently. Now, if we then look at the profitability of these, and this is the same kind of shift here, just mapped on a marginal abatement cost curve that shows you on the horizontal axis the abatement potential going all the way down. If you, if you eat yourself through this curve, uh, you, you've, you've decarbonized the building stock in, in Europe. Um, and on the, on the y-axis, you see uh, the, the cost to abate uh, uh, based on whole life cost. And we already see that some of these measures have a positive net present value. There's some no regret moves in insulation, moving it from low to mid. I can see that here in Malta being stimulated as well um, through the um, long-term renovation strategy. Uh, they are coming in the money already. Of course, there's other barriers about disruption to homes and the likes, but there's some that are coming into money. Solar thermal certainly is, is one of the, 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 the best ones there. The other ones, whilst on the right-hand side, you know, they, they may not immediately be profitable based on, based on this analysis. We do know that A, compared to other sectors, they have a real advantage because the abatement cost is lower compared to harder to abate sectors. Whilst they're not in the money, they, they definitely have an advantage there compared to others. And also there's of course a lot of ongoing work to bring these into the money. We've, we can see scaling effects on some of these technologies that do exist, but they're not quite at the levels where we need them. The scale will really 
uh, drive down the cost there. We see, of course, government incentives to bring these down. There could be a horizontal line drawn at a tax, carbon tax level as well, that, that will change the picture here altogether. But overall, we've already got significant opportunities here to, to have a positive net, uh, net present value. If we then move to the fourth belief, it's not just a technical game. A couple of illustrations here that um, are there to illustrate quite a few key messages, and I'm gonna reiterate to some extent what's been shared before. But the first one on the left-hand side is the system level view that we truly believe is important here to capture the maximum opportunity. If we all think about our real assets, we often focus on the efficiency of the asset. How much can we generate to, uh, in terms of solar energy, for example, to, um, to power our asset effectively? But what we believe and what we see at scale is that the physical assets will play a much, much bigger role in the system transition. Meaning, why not generating locally more than you consume? Why not storing it? Why not through that taking pressure off the grid, which is having its own challenges in terms of capacity and investments needed to bring that up? Why not think beyond the carbon side of things into the more social uh, measures? We've all seen it during COVID, how much physical assets helped play a role in local resilience. We're thinking about vaccination here. We're thinking about other measures. All this, I think, will play a much, much bigger role, and the real assets will be, will be playing a real role within that, within that bigger transition. And then on the, the right-hand side, the collaboration. Definitely not at all cost, but with a real purpose. We've mentioned it many times. No single player can capture any of these big opportunities alone. We could flood the market with, with a you know, supply of a certain... Uh, heating technology, the uptake probably still wouldn't be there. We all need to work together to really get to the scale that we have to get to. And I find it extremely encouraging on the type of collaboration we see, everything from open source data sharing. It often starts there. We often don't have the real data to make decisions. We're now having several sources in this space on real estate, on infrastructure, where players are sharing their emissions data, players are sharing their um, cost, abatement cost data for the greater good, which is fantastic. We also see players integrating and, and, and collaborating to overcome all the customer barriers that we're aware of. The Honorable Minister, you mentioned earlier, a lot of the end consumers don't even know, don't even challenge where the emissions come from. Now, we have uh, models that we see where, for example, uh, um, heating tech manufacturers and, and installers are are collaborating with banks, banks providing the upfront cost so that the end customer gets a solution at a high quality and the upfront cost is funded outside of, outside of that transaction. And we also then see them pairing with developers to get access to the stock because one thing is to have that end-to-end -end solution, the other one is getting access to the stock. And this is often very powerful and very, very purposeful collaborations that I encourage you to think about and to debate as we go through the day. Now, what does all this mean in, in terms of opportunity? There was a lot of technical details I appreciate that so far, but there could be found significant value pools across sectors, again at the system level, and buildings can offer one of the largest in the near term, which is no surprise. We talked about the hidden giant, the huge, huge opportunity uh, in terms of carbon emissions and decarbonization. That translates here in what we estimate to be the addressable market size in 2030. So again, very, very near term, and it'll obviously develop towards that over the coming years for selected categories. Numbers in US billion dollars, global numbers, of course, they'll vary economy by economy. Um, the, the chairman shared already some numbers for Malta specifically, but what this will trigger almost certainly is a huge, huge leap in new players entering the industry, entering potentially this market, bringing solutions at lower cost and seizing this as an opportunity. And it'll be a vast range of, of drivers for this addressable market. We just put a few examples here, design services, design and engineering services, construction advisory uh, already emerging, green building materials, new materials, same materials produced in a different way. Um, we see <clears throat> 
high efficiency equipment and alternative fuels, green building technologies to reduce the demand, all things that will contribute to this and all opportunities for us to capture. Now, how do we win in this? Which take, you know, takes us to that, that final belief. We, we truly believe that leaning forward is the right way to go. We talked about the cost of not acting, which is here illustrated on the left-hand side, and the cost of leaning forward, or the opportunity of leaning forward here in, in lighter blue. Let me unpick this a little bit, because I find this chart fascinating. You can draw it for almost every industry, and we've done a lot of analysis for different players. Here, I'm sharing um, a sanitized version of a real estate developer. If you're taking the, the choice to go through an unmanaged pathway, where measures may not be net, <clears throat> I may need a water if, if one of you would be so kind, otherwise you'll just have to look at the slides. Thank you, thank you so much. If you look at the left-hand side, if you, if you choose, despite all the facts that, that we shared this morning, to do the unmanaged pathway, to take this facility management approach without being disrespectful towards that industry, examples, the deep retrofits, they're rarely pursued, uh, capital intensive, a bit more reactive, uh, the energy efficiency, you may go for the low-hanging fruit, but, but you, know, you may stumble across, across penalties and the likes uh, in the nearer term, you're most likely going to end up at an overall NPV loss. Now, the upside compared to this, doing it the managed way, doing it the purposeful way, you know, at the earliest possible point, you maximize the savings. You really take the long-term investment view, de-risk that as much as you can. You go for the deep retrofit, um, the, the, the right sources of renewals. Broken down, you're all sanitized. All the different upside opportunities you're tapping into far outweigh of what you would achieve in terms of unmanaged pathway and, and, and even if you were protecting that downside. For us, the clear message is time is now and leaning forward to make sure that the market size potentially that we saw on the previous page is captured, but also is being built in a very purposeful and climate-focused way. We want to achieve the quickest abatement at the lowest cost for, 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 for the overall climate dynamics to shift. With that in mind, three things I want to leave you with. Um, maybe to, to debate today, and obviously I'm here today happy to, to, pick, to pick this up um, over, over the lunch break as well, but three things to thrive through the climate transition, and again I'm reiterating, and to make it a valuable contribution to the world's ability to meet the climate challenge, um, especially for real estate players that can be considered. One is to build climate investing strategy building the capabilities, firstly understanding the capabilities that are needed in your specific uh, part of the value chain, but also across the value chain, and really setting that very clear strategy, taking the system level into account. Then plan for a cost-optimal decarbonization. So really go deep into the current prices, the current technology, but also understand in full visibility and, and, and the, capture the right data on, on, on uh, to underlie your decision making. All important measures, improve those as you go along, work with analytical capabilities to make sure your portfolio business is transitioning in the most net positive way. And then thirdly, and arguably the most exciting one, really think about new green growth opportunities. Whether you want to pivot your business, whether you want to start small somewhere, whether you want to build a new business to enter this, there is tons of opportunities within there, and we truly believe that without creating new green growth opportunities, there's not much of a chance to win going forward in, in, in this very ecosystem. What does it require? Who do I collaborate with? All questions that, of course, would be extremely exciting to, to be discussed today. Whilst you're all in the room, I think it's an amazing opportunity. Thank you again for the Bank of Valletta to organizing this, for inviting us to share this European and global perspective. I hope it was helpful for you. Appreciate a lot of numbers and a lot of things we went through. But I'm extremely excited about the opportunity and yeah, happy to discuss further as we go through the day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Himmelhorst. Cheers, thank you so much.
to that very insightful, knowledgeable presentation, well studied presentation, uh, not only outlining uh, the risks, but also solutions and future pathways. So with that, uh, let's jump into a panel discussion. So I'd like to invite on stage economist by profession, partner at EY, and also one of the co-founders of uh, ESG Alliance Malta, or otherwise Malta ESG Alliance, Chris Mela. So please join me on stage. CEO of Bank of Valletta, Mr. Kenneth Faruja. A former BOV employee, an investment consultant, and a consultant with the Ministry for Energy Enterprise, and also now recently appointed CEO of Project Green, Steve Lul. <laughs> Permanent Secretary at the Ministry for Economy, EU Funds and Lands, Mr. Ronald Mitzi. And I'm really excited, and I know most of you are intrigued to learn more about the real industry, real estate players. What's their take on the subject matter today? With that, I'd like to invite on stage, I saw him around, Kenneth uh, Mr. Stivala, Michael Stivala, Michael Stivala, <laughs> not Kenneth Stivala, Michael Stivala, <laughs> last year's president of the Motor Developers Association. So with that, Michael, actually, I'm going to start with you, if I may. Possibly you can enlighten us with how the real estate industry, property, construction industry, whatever umbrella term you want to use, <coughs> is trying to tackle climate change and all the challenges that it is posing. Well, let me start. For us, it's not a time for action. As, a, an, as an industry, we tried and we started a long time ago. Let me tell you a short, a short story. In 2006, EPC regulations were introduced in Malta. Mm. And for a number of years, we had no assessors. Mm. Then, we had the financial crisis in 2008, where energy bill skyrocketed, as everyone remembers. And the developers started reacting. Started reacting because there was an economic slowdown, energy bills skyrocketed, and they started building residential buildings which were energy efficient. What happened? That instead of doing more money or break even, they ended up losing money. Why? Because the consumer did not understand what are the beneficiary of having an energy efficient residential unit. So that developer who was building standard apartments and those who were building uh, energy efficient, we're basically competing for the same consumer, and the consumer didn't know the difference. This was 15 years back, This right? was 17. in 2010. Okay, so 13 years so, back. So, exactly. Then what happened? In 2012, 2013, all of a sudden, DPC certificate came back to life, mm -hmm. because for a number of years, the authorities were basically there were the rules, and no one was asking for this certificate. The authorities all of a sudden started asking for the certificates for the previous years. I'm saying all this for a simple reason. Let's not try and blame any one party. We need to all work together. So we have the government, the developers, and we have the financial institutions. Unless we work properly together with a proper plan and everyone within the same parameters, mm -hmm. not one goes for, to, to for a direction and the others, unless we do this, we cannot achieve nothing. Mr. Sivala, I fully understand that, but it seems like you're the key players here. No. You need to take action. No, I, so I, have, I have more that. solutions. I have solutions. In 2015, myself, I've been in the association now for 12 years, I started lobbying with the government that this EPC cert certificate will be marketed with every single property. So we start teaching the consumer. So if you see a property advertise, you will see that this property is graded A, B, C, D. So why? Because we need also the consumer to understand 
what is involved. Mm -hmm. So we have the government, we need regulation, not over-regulation, and regulations which make sense mm -hmm. and which can be applied. We need the, the developer also, at the end, the developer, what's a developer? A developer is a person who buys land, mm -hmm. gets a constructor to build it, and sells the, pro mm -hmm. the property. They have to make profit. Now, if the, co the cost increases, someone has to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, it's not a cost. This cost, I see it as an investment. I believe a lot that we need to do this <coughs> myself. Now, but, do you, but do you think your peers, other investors, other developers are on the same wavelength like yourself? Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. Because it makes business sense. Why? Because we want our consumer to have more disposable income. Don't forget that if they buy property which consumes a lot of energy, and as you know, this is not the first energy crisis, this is a, and we are sure that it's not going to be the last energy crisis, so let's prepare for the next one. Mm -hmm. Let's start by do, taking proper action, mm -hmm. where all parties are connected together with the same plan, and I'm going to say it. And let me tell you another thing. 2015. Very briefly. Just, 2015, <laughs> 2015, I myself, it, again, we started lobbying for tax incentives for property which re reaching certain grade. Unfortunately, we did not succeed. It. And if you see the, our proposals of the last budget, you can see that 80% of our proposals were all based on having more energy efficient buildings. I that's good. Continue. That's good news. That's good news. Possibly we, ha we can we can um, have Mr. Mitzi and possibly Mr. Elul given their roles in the respective ministries to share some insights into that. But Chris, if I may rope you in to give us possibly an independent, objective view of the local context, because Mr. Him Himhorst gave us. Uh, an exceptional overview of what's happening in Europe and internationally. Possibly you're more acquainted with the local scene. What's, what's your take on <coughs> how developers and real estate players are trying to tackle this, uh, this challenge, but that poses a lot of opportunities as well? Um, I, I think the, lo the local, the local um, construction and real estate industry is very responsive to demand. Um, uh, demand, demand tends to, to to, to change in a slow way. Um, however, responsiveness is quite, is quite there. You can see it through the projects. And at the moment, demand for, let's say, greener buildings or more efficient buildings is in there. So, so if you look at the pockets of, let's say, groups of categories, residential, for example, the, the, the end user, they're, they're not pricing it in. They, they won't pay extra. So I, I guess the, the revolution needs to, will start from the large companies. So those which are subject will be subject to more disclosure requirements, and those will be more careful in terms of what building they buildings they occupy, what buildings they're, they're investing. Uh, and no, don't just think of, let's say, a, a company needing just a head office, but think of all those companies that use investment properties as part of their strengthening their balance sheet. So they need to invest in property, and they need to, to get a return. So those large companies, medium companies, will start by asking, by demanding certain standards. By standards, I mean, for example, the energy efficiency will be key. They will price it in there. Uh, earlier today, we heard about the MPV, no? They will price it in. Think of how a, a property is valued. You have the replacement cost approach, you have the income approach, and you have the market approach. The income approach is not just the rent you'll, you'll be getting, but if there are energy savings, that's savings, that's also revenue. If there are costs that need to be incurred to bring it up to future regulation, you have to price that in as well. Think of, imagine buying a hotel and uh, next year, you know, there's a big capital overhaul. You won't pay extra, you'll, you'll, you'll ask for a discount because you will need to pay for that. And this will work in a similar way. So just to maybe sum up uh, mm -hmm. and, and, as, and again refer to your question, I think you know, certain brackets are not at the moment appreciating or willing to pay extra for. Um, so hence the need for awareness and, and probably government regulation, but also the role of the banks. And I guess that's why we're here today. But on the other side, so, so the, the large, large and medium-sized corporates, I think there's already demand for certain, certain type of, of requirements which fit into what we've heard today. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris. Possibly, Steve, you can possibly help us unpack all the complexities and peculiarities related to 
the challenges ahead of us. But possibly, what I'm sensing is we're not truly understanding, firstly, the challenges, and even more so, um, the opportunities if we embrace these ESG elements yes. and sustainability within our business. So let me, let me tackle that straight away. I think something which I think is extremely important for us to understand is why we're here today. And we're here today, and I think the minister mentioned this in, the, in, in, his, in his speech, is because we really need to ensure that in the next three decades, we have a better economy, we have a more sustainable economy, and a more robust economy uh, to, operate in, to operate in, and a better country to run. And this is our objective. We really want a decarbonized economy and a carbon-free uh, country to live in. And definitely, the construction industry is critical and pivotal in all this. Just let us make no mistake, 75% of all our emissions here in Malta come either from the construction industry, from transportation, or from energy. Okay, so this, this industry is critical, and in my view, uh, we're quite in a sweet spot today because this industry can definitely be supported by the financial industry in its transition. And I need to pick up on two points mentioned by Mike and Mike Chris, which I think are extremely important. I tend to agree with some of the points, might disagree with some of others, but I think something which is extremely important is that, yes, this industry is demand-driven, like pretty much any other industry. So we really need to make sure and let me put in some, some food for thought here. We need to make sure that we stimulate this demand, even from the residential perspective and from corporate uh, owners going into the construction industry. What if we had, in this country, rather than having carpet uh, measures that incentivize, that incentivize uh, property acquisition, what if we had to redirect those measures exclusively to green construction? So, a couple of years ago, I think two or three years ago, we had this, uh, I think, a very, a very good budget measure which incentivized UCA um, acquisition. I think that's a very green um, incentive because that really directs, um, uh, directs the, the demand towards one particular existent um, stock of property. What if we had to incentivize with all the NI support, uh, national insurance reduction support, and other tax incentives, the acquisition of green, green construction? I'm pretty much sure the industry will, uh, will definitely uh, reflect that, will definitely be in a position to uh, start redirecting supply towards green construction. Um, and I take comfort from the very fact that without these incentives, or, or with just an element of these incentives, we already have some construction companies here in Malta, some companies here in Malta already, um, that are already investing directly in green construction rather than going conventional. I mean, we've had a nice presentation from McKinsey looking into what's happening in the US. I really care about my country. And we have companies here in Malta, I mean, very close to BOV Center in Santa Venera. They are actually running an eight building, constructing an eight building, an eight story um, uh, building, which is a green uh, building, which will be made up of office spaces for companies, like Chris mentioned, that in a couple of years' time, they will start. To, they will need to report their carbon emissions. So they will need to decipher whether to invest in a conventional building or in a green construction. So we have industry leaders here in Malta. So kudos to these leaders. We need more, and we need to incentivize these construction companies. But, of course, I really believe, and this is my... Uh, first of all, I feel quite comfortable today because I've been working for, as an asset manager for, for, for the bank for quite a number of years, and I know the strength and the impetus that the financial industry can drive, particularly Bank of Alta, but other market players in this aspect as well. We have a great opportunity in the financial industry here in Malta. We have today 25 billion euros lying idle in Kenneth Farouja's bank, uh, not, not just his bank, <laughs> but uh, all, of the, all, of the, all, of the, all of the banks. Let's get those, that money out of there. Let's um, reduce the burden from the bank side. Let's invest that money in, in, in Maltese companies going for the green transition. And the construction industry here can be a major beneficiary of all this, 60% of the existing investment on the Maltese Stock Exchange, and that's money which, which usually is left lying idle in bank deposits, is invested in the construction industry. What if we manage to unlock all that amount of money today, reduce the burden from the banks, 
and invest that money in green construction. So we make sure that we have that the next 30 years won't be just like the, the last 30 years because what was successful in the last 30 years might not be successful in the next three decades. So we need more green construction. We need to incentivize that. The money is there. In my opinion, we need the financial plumbing that redirects that money towards green construction. One last item that I'd love to mention because I've heard um, Michael um, uh, speaking about this and also um, in the previous presentation by McKinsey, which I think was a very good presentation, um, is about retrofitting. Yes, we can invest in green construction and we can issue green bonds for that, but I think something which is extremely important if we are really committed to decarbonization is the investment in retrofitting. And here is where I think the EPC certificate really needs to take up a new level. Uh, we really need to level it up. Uh, we really need to make sure, and I understand the point being raised, that new, new building and also the existing stock needs to be labeled with proper EPC certificates. Um, that will incentivize, in my opinion, even, financial industry, in, even the financial industries, even banks, to lower their interest um, in their interest rates for green loans. And I think something is already brewing um, in this sense. But retrofitting is extremely important. Uh, I think we need to look at what's happening in other European countries. I've been mapping quite a while what's happening in other European jurisdictions. I love the idea that was brought about by the European Commission very, very recently on retrofitting. It is being already um, adopted in Italy where you would have a specific incentive as a client, as an individual, in terms of tax reduction, if you, if you invest directly in retrofitting. And I think there is a significant um, role, to, role to be played even by fin the financial industry here. Steve, thank you so much. I noticed uh, Mr. Stivana, that was music to his ears and to all the real estate <laughs> players that will level up the EPC uh, certificate. Uh, Mr. Farooja, I've noticed earlier on both um, speakers, ministers, Rinzo Azzopardi, um, uh, Farah Kim Horst, and also Dr. Cordina, they mentioned four words, collaboration, partnership, and time is now. So focusing on collaboration and partnership, how BOV expects to be an effective partner to all, all real estate players in this transition? Look, the theme of this conference, rightly so, revolves around construction and real estate. And as Steve rightly said, this is a reflection of the importance of the real estate sector to the national, to the national economy. Nonetheless, if you look at the ecosystem, it is more complex than that. We are not here just finger pointing developers and contractors and saying you need to do something about it. Because there are quite a number of other enablers or catalysts or ambassadors that need to have an important role to play. And I think about engineers, I think about architects, I think about the national government. And this is where we really need to show as a country how agile we are to mobilize all these operators that are in the critical part, you know, towards really greening our economy going forward. Now, I think the biggest challenge is reconciling the short-term costs of transitioning to green, and I wouldn't say the long-term, I'd say the medium-term value creation, because there is value creation in a number of areas. Um, there is evidence, clearly, that buildings that have been developed uh, with green in mind, so green design, has a higher value in the medium-term, whether it's from a tenancy perspective, because there are tenants that are ready to pay for greener buildings, because they save on energy costs. Some of the buildings today are already catering for the inconvenience of having to imagine living in a block and having to take down your black bag and your, green, your gray bag every single day, right? Where they have shoots today where you can really place that garbage down the chute and it goes down in the basement in garbage cans which are then collected. So we're, and this is part of well-being as well, right? So there are these influences, in my view, that will have a bearing and will inherently shift contractors and developers to start developing units for these markets. And we're seeing that. Now, why have we organized this conference and why are we taking a leadership role in you know, focusing and zooming in on the, on the construction sector. 
because we are inherently the largest bank in Malta, and I say that not to gloat, but because we have a responsibility, and we feel that we are shouldered with that, to really support and address the gap in knowledge that there is between where we are today and where we need to be. And clearly, there is a lot of ground to cover. Banks, it's evidently clear, banks have a significant and important role to play because this transition needs to be financed. And we have recently, last, um, last year, late last year, launched a product, and Steve was referring to the provision of solutions which have a favorable interest rate. Um, they say there's no free lunch in banking, uh, but we've actually introduced a 10-year product at zero interest rate. Um, um, now some people will raise their, their eyebrows, but the reality is that as a banking group, um, given our relationship with the European Investment Bank, we've launched a product which caters for you know, investments up to three quarters of a million to allow companies that want to invest in green buildings to finance this investment at literally zero interest for a 10-year period. And this is the value that we want to bring to the market. So the value that we are bringing is one towards enhancing the knowledge of not just contractors and developers. This is the first of a series of initiatives that we will be organizing to enhance the knowledge of the marketplace. But more than that, to have two influences. One, to develop innovative financial solutions for buyers because we need to incentivize buyers to go for green buildings. But equally to support developers and contractors that are developing green units because they need to be supported, right? This transition needs to be financed. And we're seeing, as Steve said, you know, the European Commission together with national government bringing solutions to the market which we are packaging to address these two realities. This is the important role that our bank will play in the process. And, you know, we've realized this, you know, as a big organization. Today we employ 2,100 people. That we need to lead by example. So, you know, my colleague Miguel Borg, who's responsible for risk, took forward, together with Clinton here, took forward an initiative. So we established the carbon footprint of the bank, right? On the basis of which now we are creating a roadmap to markedly reduce our carbon footprint by 2030, right, before the 2050 deadline, because we want to accelerate the pace to get there. And the number of initiatives that we're taking, and we're sharing these with the clients that I'm meeting, we're sharing what we have done, you know, in assessing um, the type of cars that our employees use to go to the office, right, whether they're fuel, whether they're uh, hybrids or electric, right, and the impact on, on carbon emissions. We looked at our servers that we use and the carbon that they emit. We looked at sort of the energy lighting that we utilize. You know, so we looked at these things and we're starting to apply, for example, recyclable material in the branches that we're refurbishing or the refurbishment we're carrying out to our head office. We're looking to shift our fleet of cars to electric cars because we need to lead by example. And I can tell you, I'm pleased to note in my first few months that I've been CEO of this bank, and I feel privileged to be the CEO of this, this largest organization in Malta. I'm meeting large clients, and I'm pleased to note that ESG is on their agenda. Yeah. But clearly, we all know that the economy in, in Malta is made up of a number of small and medium-sized enterprises. And they need more hand-holding, and they need more support. You know, so we start gravitating you know, this cohort towards a greener economy. And we will play an active role in that particular space. Thank you so much, Mr. Kenneth Farouja, for sharing those insights into how the bank is instigating behavioral change, both the developers, real estate players, and consumers as well, but also within the banking infrastructure, within BOV itself, you're trying to walk the talk. So, and possibly to walk the talk and to instigate <coughs> further change on a national level, we need policy, we need the government. And uh, I'd like to rope in Mr. Mitzi on how the government, in a tangible manner, is trying to support this uh, transition to a greener world and a less polluting environment. Um, first of all, Keith, um, let's not forget that this, this whole transition is not anymore a nice thing to have, but this is mandatory. It has to happen. There are rules, there are obligations, there are directives at each and every stage of this whole 
ecosystem, be it buildings, environments, um, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, transport, etc. So this transition um, has to take place. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not optional. Definitely. And. Uh, so let's not forget, for instance, because sometimes we tend to focus um, too much on, on consumption and energy efficiency. But you have, you've asked me not what government is doing. Let's not forget, for instance, that government has tackled the, the main source of this problem, which is energy generation. Um, uh, let's not forget that the, the energy which is being generated right now in Malta today is much, much cleaner than what we used to have 10, 10 12 years ago. And thanks to the massive investment that the government has taken at, at, the, at the core source of the, of the, of the, um, of the main source of emissions. Um, thanks to the investment which was undertaken there in the power plants and also the significant uptake which we've had in the last 10 years in uh, renewable, renewable energy sources, which is which, which, where there was a significant, significant uptake. As government, we have always, always been, successive governments have always been on the forefront um, in the promotion of emerging technologies. You name it, roof insulation, double glazing, um, more, more recently um, heat pumps. Um, such measures have um, two, main, two main objectives. First of all, we give direct assistance to the developers or the buyers or the homeowners, especially when it comes to emerging technology because um, often they are still, still, still expensive. Um, so there is a financial barrier to, ent um, to entry. And also by increasing the uptake, by instilling more confidence. Okay, because at, as you know, there's always a little bit of, of skepticism, skepticism at first. Then there are all other, other schemes and, and, and initiatives um, which governments are undertaking, various awareness projects, because we need to instill more, more awareness in, in, whole, in all this debate. There is also, um, obviously, the direct investment in energy efficiency projects, um, be, it, um, be it in new buildings, but also in retrofits, because sometimes we focus a little, but, a little bit too much on new buildings, and we forget the potential of uh, retrofitting. Um, we have schemes um, for, to, to instill more confidence in, in, in the uptake of, of buying um, houses and refurbishing, refurbishing idle, idle dwellings in, in, in UCAs. For the commercial sector, um, there is also support in the form of cash grants and tax credits, or a combination of both, um, intended to facilitate the investment in technology solutions um, that provide higher energy efficiency and also contribute directly um, towards a reduction in energy requirements. There are also incentives include the upgrades of equipment, um, reduction in energy consumption, um, digitalization as well, which, which also plays a part in, in all this debate. And tied to this, there is also, perhaps indirectly, um, for the contractors, the replacement of heavy machinery. Sure. Um, then there are also, the, the, obviously, the more traditional schemes, like the, the, the ones we've, we've been used to now, um, the uptake of uh, PV panels, solar water heaters, and also p heat pumps. Um, perhaps the construction sector should start to incorporate more these technologies as an intrinsic part of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the fabric, of the design of, 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 of our buildings. For instance, heat pumps. Sometimes we, we receive complaints that uh, designers or they don't leave the, the appropriate space, reserve the appropriate space for, for heat pumps, making then installation even more complicated um, later on. Um, other schemes include, obviously, um, refurbishing of, of water wells, um, which is a scarce commodity, um, roof insulation and double glazing schemes. Um, as government, perhaps by way of criticizing, uh, perhaps we haven't been too much um, strong on enforcement sometimes, um, but perhaps this also is a breakthrough and provides an opportunity because uh, as Michael said and other, the other speakers said, I think we need to arrive at a point where developers and sellers, um, in a way, market their buildings as energy efficiency. And this, this is an opportunity because, in my opinion, let's face it, um, perhaps apart from location, there's not much one can differ between, between one building and another. So this is a way where one apartment or one building can stand out 
uh, versus another, in my opinion. Thank you so much, Mr. Mitzi, for allowing all those initiatives and uh, supporting schemes to help the industry move transition into a greener business model. One, one thing that I forgot to mention, Keith, um, obviously government's assistance is also very much regulated um, because of, especially, especially when it comes to the commercial and business sector, because obviously we're tied with competition rules and, and so on. Um, there's a huge discussion going on right now at the European Commission on, on the state, state aid regimes, which is, without something too technical, is, uh, the, they are the legal means by which governments can assist um, businesses. There's a whole rethinking process, especially um, after COVID, and uh, also with, with uh, what's happening now with, 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 with the war, and also with this drive of the, of the European Commission to keep our industries um, within the block and not seeing them emerging outside, outside, outside um, leaving the block and going to the likes of China, US, etc. Um, this is a very important debate with, to which government is con our government is contributing actively uh, because it facilitates or simplifies the means by which government can assist our businesses. Thank you so much, Mr. Mitzi. I could sense that both uh, Dr. Cordina, uh, Chairman of BOV, and also Mr. Farouja, they're organizing also this conference partly to try and create a united front all together, economists, policymakers, different stakeholders, to try and shed more light on this challenge and also um, try to work together to address all the challenges and create, as Mr. Empor said, a ton of opportunities ahead of us. So I'd like to ask you as president of MDA, if MDA is truly a united front, I know you mentioned subtly that you some members might be a bit skeptical yes. about, about this. How are you going to tackle that? Now, in a, like in every industry, you will have the um, members who would like uh, to be more uh, proactive, and there will be members who are, you know, they like the status quo, because it's simpler. It is simpler, it is uh, sometimes a bit more profitable, but as an association, we are not there for them. We are here to speak on behalf of those who want to change, in fact, we've been doing so for the past years. We do not, re you know, anyone who's, who wants the status quo, including government entities, including uh, institutions, we are not with them. We want change, we, and we want the change. We've been wanting the change for many years, and we want it as soon as possible. And, uh, for example, we were discussing about incentives. We push, for example, that they are not over-bureaucratic. Now, one of the main issues is that we have been uh, requesting that rather than an individuals, currently, if you want to do PV panels, every individual can get support. We've been asking uh, to remodel this, uh, because we need to think out of the box. Mm -hmm. So we were, t we were asking the government to say, hey, let the developer apply for the funds on the PV panels. And instead of the owners of the apartments, install them individually, which means he will bring the cranes eight times. You have to do eight deals. You, the developer will get a better deal, less disturbance, and then passes that rights to the, to the uh, apartment owner. So we need to change the way. What we have been doing, it's not enough. And I think we have to do drastic changes to, uh, to reach our goals. With the, current, uh, with the current pace, I don't think we will be reaching the, the goals, Malta's goals. So, by keeping the status quo, for sure we're not going to succeed and we're going to incur penalties. Now, what is the ideal situation? The ideal situation is very simple. I, I, I don't see it as complex as everyone is seeing it. Consumer awareness. Mm -hmm. Yes, regulations. There has to be regulations, but regulations, unfortunately, most of the times, by itself, because they feel punitive. We have to embrace climate change. It is not something that we are punishing the people. We don't need to increase interest rates to those who, are, who don't have energy-efficient buildings, but we need to incentivize those who are doing the positive thing. Let's not send a signal out there, you know, that this is something that we're going to punish people. Otherwise, people will 
keep away from it. I wouldn't use that word. I would incentivize people. Instead. Yes, exactly. I agree completely. But if you're going to stay saying regulations, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But that's the reality, and, you know. But if we if we if we pass through incentives true message that this is for your own good. In fact, recently we've done, we've done with Minister Miriam Dalli um, uh, a, a, a campaign for businesses, um, for businesses that, uh, you know, currently the government is supporting a lot of businesses uh, through a 600 million euro support, which in reality, I was very surprised when I saw Gordon Cordina's figures. This 700 million euro, just the government last year and this year supported the families and the industry with one billion euro. So I'm sure that if our properties, our culture, the people over out there, and including everyone, no, would have done a better job, I'm sure that out of this one billion euro, there would have been savings which would have been invested in more renewable energy and whatever. So let's look forward now. I think this that simplifying to apply for a PV panel we with an MDA, we don't have all the developers, we have renewable energy suppliers, we have condominium companies, we have now traders, we launched a new section. We represent the whole spectrum of the, and we, we, we understand every part from purchasing the land to getting the permits, it is a whole process. And when you, when you do the process over bureaucratic, Oh, you know, we don't, we don't want everyone does in, doing whatever they like. We want rules with sense, rules where they achieve results, rules where people, they don't get tired of filling papers and in reality achieving nothing. And over there where the business community and the citizens in general are suffering, if you speak to common people who have a system, a business panel, and you try and explain, for example, a lot of systems currently are going to expire. And for them, if they want to increase the panels, they tell, you know, it's so it's bureaucratic. It's very common. We have to make it simple for the people. Mm -hmm. We have to make it it's a, as a positive comment. It, it has to be positive. We have to, you know, reward it. I like, I let, like let, this word. Let, let, I like that you. word simple. And with that, I'd like to ask Chris to possibly share with us in simple terms the first things that people like Mr. Stivala and all other real estate players need to undertake immediately to embrace this change and embed sustainability elements within their operational practices. Um, so, when, so when we talk about ESG or sustainability, it's not just climate change. So there are, there are various elements. So it goes from, from, from the, the, the governance, which I, I, I think is in place in many companies, the committees, the division of roles, the, the, the supervision, internal audit, external. So that is traditional governance. To the social, and social is zooming in on your own workforce, then you know, the supply chain and the users of, of your products. So, so the, the social elements over there, um, health and safety, uh, labor conditions, to the environment. So climate change is, 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 is a part of, let's say, a subset of the whole thing. Um, and I, th I think uh, when you say embrace, embrace th th this, this change, I think first of all, it's not something which is happening. Um, there's nothing and then all of a sudden we have to put everything in place. It's, it's something which is gradually already in place and we, need to, we obviously need to step up. And then I think secondly, um, th there's this point of mentality change. So, so we need to understand that regulation is forcing us to increase the pace, but at the end of the day, the medium benefits are, are there. It's for our own benefit. Th this concept of sustainability is about future generations. And I think individually do, we do that with our own our family nucleus. You know, when we, when we heard about the Mediterranean way of life, the, the quality of life, it's about family, it's about you know, passing on values, um, store of wealth and all that. And likewise within our community. I think this, this, this point clearly emerged during COVID, the, the need to, to better embrace our environment, to appreciate. Sometimes I feel we're going back now and forgetting some of those elements which were exposed. However, on this one, on this specific point, I think regulation 
it is a key point. I know it, it sometimes feels penalties, but, but it is a way of, of doing direction. So if I, I use the example of cars, for example, and we want to push cl cleaner cars, you can either link it to the license, which we've done, so, so people go to buy a car and ask about emissions, so automatically they're aware. You can link it, link it to the diesel you use or the fuel you use, which we haven't, no? And diesel is cheaper than, than petrol. Some other, not some other countries, diesel is more expensive. Or you can actually ban some cars, no? Ban internal combustion, which we'll be, be doing. So you can see different levels of, of triggers. And, and when we talk about regulation, there is this feeling that maybe here we're, we're, we're um, guests of a bank where regulations are, are, are definitely uh, something which they face, fa face on a daily basis, but from an individual point of view, uh, or a, let's say a large corporate point of view, it could be, let me first disclose and share information and, and therefore collaborate, but then eventually know that will be asked. So what action will you take? What is your strategy? And I think over there, we, we have to realize that, that regulation will have to um, speed up the process because otherwise we won't be able, let's say, to internalize all these future externalities that we're causing. You mentioned regulations and equally important, as Mr. Mitzi said, is enforcement. And with that, Mr. Mitzi, I'd like to ask you uh, how the government can help the whole ecosystem to see value in the change that we need to undertake. I think there are, there are many positives in all this. For instance, um, a, a recent K um, KPMG study also um, found that residents in Malta are very environmentally conscious and uh, they are willing to pay more for sustainable products. So that, that's a positive. Um, obviously, generally, citizens expect government to be a prime mover in all this, as we were saying. But um, as Chris said, regulation, regulation and enforcement remain important, but also coupled with um, awareness, um, education, proper education for present and future generations, and also that uh, society at large sees government as, uh, as uh, acting, acting by example. For instance, um, uh, through embedding the ESG principles more and more into its um, work program, um, for the first time now we have, um, we're seeing that government's work plan is very much being influenced and driven by the ESG, which is, which is intrinsically linked with, it, with its uh, work program, the manifesto and the, and the budget measures. Each and every measure is being in, in, intrinsically linked to, 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 to ESGs, um, ESGs in our, in our, in our procurement, in our, in our consumption, etc. cetera, um, uh, while ensuring that buildings, uh, the building its own, uh, it, because the government is ultimately also it's a, it's a landlord, it, it owns its building, um, uh, should lead by example there, and uh, ensures that the building it owns and operates are even aligned with, this, with these sustainability practices. I think that's uh, where charity begins at home, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. Bitsi. Finally, to wrap up, uh, Mr. Elul, uh, I know the government committed to invest some 700 million euros to create more green spaces within our communities, within uh, in our towns and cities, and we're desperate to have more green space. This is a recently uh, launched agency. You happen to be the CEO of this agency. How the private sector <coughs> can be part of this uh, agency's vision? The private sector will be critical because what we really want in, in all this is to make sure that we, we have the entire ecosystem of the Maltese economy investing and thinking about the environment, sustainability, about moving forward towards a better, a more a greener, a more sustainable economy. And this is also a critical element for uh, capital injection in our economy. We want our developers, we want our suppliers to think sustainably, to think green. And Project Green will be uh, incentivizing private investment in our projects. Um, and we have, uh, we're thinking about commercialization of specific projects. We're thinking a lot about PPPs and we've, we, we will be having significant discussions on this front. I'll be telegraphic on some points that, I, that I've had because I think some points were very, very important. Um, first of all, um, I think it's extremely important for the government, yes, to lead the way. 
And one way to do it, in my opinion, and there's something brewing in the space, is for green procurement to step up the game a little bit more. Um, uh, I think green procurement really will send the right signal being the procurement element of the largest player here in Malta, uh, where we want all our industries to move forward. To move forward. Inc I think it's incredibly, impo incredibly important to drive um, tax reduction because I'm all for rewards, not that much for regulation. Regulation will be there and we will need to abide with that. There's, there's nothing to do about that, but we really need to reward green investors through tax deductions, in my opinion, for specific green projects which, really make, uh, which can really make a difference, incentivizing the financial plumbing. And even there, there are specific measures being thought about, and I, I very much believe in the next budget we'll see some of them um, being announced as well, that will really incentivize the transformation and the transition of uh, funds towards green projects. Those are critical, but ultimately, and I'll stop here, Ultimately, it's all about pounds and shillings. That's the, the bare truth, the bare reality. We've seen that here in Malta, in the last three years, those companies that have invested in, envi in the environment through reduction in their, in their energy consumption, through better energy efficiency measures, those are those companies that are, some of them are listed on the stock exchange, actually, that have returned the, be the, the, best, share, the best shareholder return for our investors in the last three years. So these are companies that have seen a reduction in their carbon footprint by 34%, and they've returned, they've outperformed the broader Maltese capital market um, in the last three years. So what we're saying is that it pays to be greener, it pays because it, it's, all about, it's all about our long-term competitiveness. I think that's something which we really need to move forward, um, not just in the construction industry, but in all our sectors and our economy. Thank you so much, Steve Alul, Chris Mela, Kenneth Farouja, Ronald Mitzi, Michael Stevala. We really appreciated your insights, openness, frankness, and honesty as well. So thank you so much for that. To conclude this conference, uh, I think it's apt to invite Mr. Kenneth Farouja to share his concluding remarks. Thank you. First of all, um, I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us uh, this morning. I think you will have found this event to be insightful, enriching, and I hope very relevant to your own, to your own business. Undoubtedly, I think the takeout, and I wish to synthesize some of the key points that emerge from today's discussion. The takeout is that the ecosystem is somewhat complex. There are quite a number of dependencies, uh, influencers, enablers, be it government with political direction and, and regulation, banks with their financing uh, solutions, the investments that need to be undertaken by contractors, the knowledge or the absence of it, when it comes to buyers and those seeking uh, tenancies. So when it comes to organizations to define their ESG strategy, it's not easy. And I can share that experience at even our banking level, right? Where we have a number of properties, vis-a-vis -vis our branches, our business centers, our investment centers, a number of employees, a number of influencers that impact our carbon footprint. But the challenge really and truly, albeit defining strategy, is not easy, and it needs ownership, and this is my recommendation. You need to assign ownership to an ESG strategy. The biggest challenge is implementation. And it's not binary, it's a journey. It's a journey where gradually, to proper monitoring and reporting, you start rolling out initiatives to start reducing your carbon, your carbon footprint as an organization. And this is, I think, what needs to be shared, because let's share good practices between us. I've been in this industry for some 37 years, and sometimes I'm a bit amazed or dismayed that we do not leverage our size as a jurisdiction to be as, as agile as we should be because we should be much more agile than any other country in Europe, because we're the smallest EU member state. And maybe, and the point was made in the panel, that 
you know, sometimes we focus on the value of ESG, and maybe we focus a bit or a lot on, on the energy efficiency side, but gave little consideration or limited consideration to the social side. Right? We focus on ESG and the value that it delivers by simply, in the context of the theme of this conference, by looking at the value of property. But actually, it goes beyond that. I mean, our vision is to build a better competitive proposition as a country that depends a lot on incoming tourists, that depends a lot on FDIs, that will have a stronger appetite to be in a country which embraces ESG. And that's the end vision we should aspire and we should be driven by. Not simply what happens in the construction sector and the value that this will deliver, because it will deliver value. Not maybe in the immediate term, but in the medium term, it will deliver value. But the wider value that being a country that embraces ESG will deliver. I think the political direction and the regulation and the policies are very, very clear. And clearly, we cannot kick the can down the road, right, to be blunt. We can't waste any more time. If we look abroad, and I think McKinsey's presentation was an eye-opener, there's a lot of ground that we need to cover. I think we've come a long way, even, as I can tell you, as a banking institution in a relatively short period of time. But this momentum needs to gain greater traction. And I firmly believe that we can mobilize all these stakeholders in this national ESG drive to get there. We need to give consideration as well to four actors that are very important within the context of construction and real estate. We spoke about tenants and that tenants are seeking energy efficient buildings and that developers and contractors need to realize that there are tenants that are ready to pay a premium for energy efficient uh, buildings. But equally, we need to give cognizance to the fact that there are investors as well, be there investors that will participate in green bonds on the capital market, and banks, which will look favorably at projects which will have a positive impact on our environment. And I can tell you recently, um, as recent as last December, uh, in November to be exact, we listed it in December, we launched an international bond on the Irish Stock Exchange as part of our capital requirements. And invariably, in the investor roadshows that we delivered to a number of institutions and investors, ESG was very high on their agenda. And they really quizzed us on what is the bank doing, on its GSG, what is its roadmap, what initiatives are you rolling out. And this is going to increase. So for those organizations that are looking at the capital market, you know, prepare yourselves because investors, particularly institutional investors, this will be an important criterion. But equally on the banking side, and I do empathize with what Michael said earlier on, in so far as price discrimination, but there will be price discrimination, and this is where regulators are pushing to, to banks, are pushing the banks. You need to price discriminate between those that are driving energy efficient developments and those that are not. And this has already been in place. Um, maybe we forget the polluter pays principle that we've had in the past. It seems to have diluted itself, right? But this is where we're heading. Then there are the employees. Yes, so we spoke about tenancies or buyers, we spoke about investors, but we need to be minded about the importance that the younger generation is attributing to the values, to the ESG values embraced by their employer, which are their own values. And it's becoming evidently clear that the younger generation are very much akin to embrace ESG principles. And they would want to work for an employer that likewise embraces their principles. Last but not least, directors of companies that are being pushed to ensure, as part of their responsibilities, to ensure that there is an ESG drive within the organization. And these are important enablers as well in this ESG drive. 
So that's my synthesis. I promise to be short because I know you've been sitting down for two hours. Um, Bank of Valletta will continue playing a leading role in this ESG context. Um, we've already launched a number of products, both for personal customers, you know, prolonging the um, payment term to 15 years and a number of products to make it more accessible. Uh, we're doing the same with the business energy loans. My colleague, Mark Cicluna Bartoli, works assiduously to ensure that we have a product catalog that supports operators at the different levels. We want to be a protagonist in this. We are a founder member of the Alliance as well because we firmly believe that this will benefit the economy, it will benefit the bank, it will be the benefit our customers, but equally so it will benefit the wider society. So I leave you with that. Thank you once again for making time um, to join us today and I look forward to hosting you at our future events. Have a good day.